Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever it is that you are, wherever you may be. Thank you very much for making us a part of your day. I am Brad Franklin, creative content right here in Chesterfield, and I'm very glad to tell you that Chesterfield Behind the Mic is on the air once again. we got a great show planned for you today, so let's jump right into it. I've got Kevin Carroll here, supervisor for the Matoka District, who's joining us today. Mr. Carroll, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. I'm good. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, I, it, obviously, there's a lot. Uh, it's a very interesting time uh, in government, and, and I want to... think, s- really? <laughs> Well, isn't there always an interest? It's always an interesting time in government. Um, but I'm, I'm curious. I want to start in a, in a very kind of general place, which was I'm kind of curious just to kind of get your background a little bit. Um, when I had Jim on the show, you know, several weeks ago, you know, he talked a little bit about sort of how he became, you know, how it was that he became a supervisor. And, I, and I'm kind of interested to get your point of view on how it was that you became uh, a supervisor. Did Was that something that you sort of set out to, to do? Was it something that, that you always wanted to do as a young kid? Does one, does one grow up and think, you know, one day I want to be a, a member of the Board of Supervisors? How, was, what, how did you sort of get into it, so to speak? Well, you know, I was a Chester County police officer mm-hmm. for 32 years when I retired, and I got recruited by the state Fraternal Order Police president uh, back mm-hmm. in 2006 to take on the role of legislative chairman for the Fraternal Order of Police of Virginia and work right. within the legislature to you know, pass uh, or kill uh, legislation, so mm-hmm. to speak, that would um, benefit the community as a whole and certainly public safety. And from there, it kind of morphed into, um, I was also the local lodge president of the Fraternal Order of Police, right. and then I ended up becoming the state lodge president for the Fraternal Order of Police. And, um, you know, quite frankly, as I kind of wind down my career with the police department. I wanted to continue to be able to serve mm-hmm. uh, the community that I pretty much owe everything to. You know, right. As a young man, they, I was fortunate enough to get a job with the Chester County Police Department. I moved down here. I, I knew only one other person mm. and um, was very blessed to have a, a wonderful career in service to, to our community. And, you know, the older you get, um, you know, I used to have uh, dark hair and more of it. <laughs> and uh, the older you get, things change. And so... Right. From a physical perspective, law enforcement is really a young person's game. And so right. the older you get, um, um, you can't stay there forever. And mm-hmm. so I wanted to continue to serve my community. And, you know, when I was a young man, my father um, had served our community in Rhode Island in a similar way. He actually got elected to the town council uh, right. and back in the 70s. Uh, and so I had some experience with helping him back in the day with, uh, with putting up signs and mm. signage was totally different back then absolutely it was a, a four by eight sheet of plywood that you yep. painted your name on yep uh and so um and of course uh, i had had contact uh, throughout the years as the local lodge president with the members mm-hmm. of the board of supervisors and county administration and uh, in, in talking with them about you know public safety issues mm-hmm. so i felt like it was an area that i could continue to serve the community and um um, you know, quite blessed, uh, quite frankly, that um, um, I was chosen by the, the by the community to have this position and uh, don't take it for granted. Yeah. How do you feel like your experience uh, in law enforcement uh, prepared you for this experience as a supervisor as your perspective goes from, you know, public safety to the county as a whole, especially this last, what, two years when so much has been, you know, focused on not just, you know, the needs of the community, but the, you know, the direct needs, right, in, in, in the middle of a pandemic and everything that came with it. How do you feel like that experience in law enforcement prepared you for that? Well, I mean, certainly, you know, I know the county very well from the different positions that mm-hmm. I held within the police department. So the familiarity with the county as a whole certainly helps with that. But then from a, a bigger picture you know, my time spent with uh, Fraternal Order Police, both on the state level, gave me a uh, a wider network, mm-hmm. so to speak, of, of, of people that I knew, in both in the legislature and in mm-hmm. government. And then representing the um, uh, Commonwealth of Virginia as the state president across the country and mm-hmm. meeting with other leaders, it gave me a much larger, larger perspective mm-hmm. of what, um, uh, what happens outside of um, just public safety. Right. And so... Um, uh, and then when you once you get in the job, then you you get even more information mm-hmm. that's pushed to you uh, that uh, uh, helps you to build that uh, thousand foot level, so to speak, when right. you're looking at uh, things globally uh, for the community. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of things that are you know near and dear to you, as you look forward for Chesterfield, as you you know get even more and more experience in this specific side of things, what are some of the things that really stand out to you, some of the, the bigger objectives as you look forward? And, and, and how does that experience sort of drive those uh, determinations for you? 
Well, I mean, I, I certainly think that um, uh, having a safe community, public safety, is I still think the basic foundation mm-hmm. and fundamental for what government should be providing uh, mm-hmm. to the people. I think that's why governments, part of the reason why governments were formed is to, to make sure that our communities are safe, that, you know, when people are looking to where they want to move, they're looking at crime rates. They're right. looking to see, uh, you know, and what, if you look at the national news and you look at all the big cities right now, no one wants to live there because of the, the, the murder rate, the crime rate, um, the, the looting that takes place within stores in broad daylight. And so when people look where they want to live, um, they look for where it's going to be safe. Can you feel safe going to the store? Uh, do you feel safe going out to dinner at night? And, and not just for themselves, but for their kids, for their family. And then the next thing I think they look at is um, um, public schools. Mm-hmm. You know, what type of school system uh, is, is the locality providing? Is it really good for education for the kids? Right. Um, and that's for people who have school-age children. And then when you look at older people, which is probably the, the fastest-growing demographic in Chesterfield, the over-55 right. community, it's... It's about uh, what amenities are available to them within the community. Um, how far are those amenities from where they're living? Is it uh, uh, what type of um, choice are they getting within the community to live? Um, you know, if you look at some of the um, uh, up in Westchester, for example, up in Melothian, where you have a bunch of different shops and restaurants, mm-hmm. and now you have a bunch of different housing units that are going in where you can literally live there and then walk to work. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you work across the street in a medical building or if you work in one of the stores, whether right. it be the Target movie theater, whatever it may be. And so I think that quality of life of live, work, and play is important. And, mm-hmm. and, and uh, I think that's what a lot of people who are moving here from other parts of the country are looking for. And so we need to be mindful of that, mm-hmm. um, you know, um, from a land use perspective on what we do in the, uh, in the community and make sure that we're providing choice and, at the same time, you have to look at um, you know long-term uh, goals. Uh, I think that's important that you know uh, elected leaders look at not just where the county is right now on the immediate, right, right. but where we're we going to be in 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Right. Um, and because there are things today that you need to take care of in order for those things to happen. Mm-hmm. I know for you in, in our conversations, you know, transportation a, bit, a part of that you know sort of long-term. You know, not just, you know, what is it like today? You know, what's the infrastructure like right now? But what's it going to be like in, you know, those down the, the road sort of um, time frames? And one of the things that has become apparent to me in, in being involved in government is, is the idea that a lot of folks don't really realize sometimes how things really work. For example, a lot of folks don't realize that their roads aren't necessarily maintained by Chesterfield County, that those roads are maintained by BDOT, and that if you or the other members of the board want to make improvements to their roadway that it's not just your call, right? That VDOT has to be involved. And there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that calculus. Uh, from your position as a supervisor, how, how important is, is that aspect in, in terms of not just the education for folks and understanding like how the process works, but also in the terms of the long-term planning for things like transportation? Well, I mean, certainly the Richmond region is for years been fighting for statewide dollars mm-hmm. for transportation needs against, uh, you know, the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority and the Hampton Roads uh, Transportation Authority. And with the creation of the Central Virginia Transportation Authority, it actually puts the nine localities in Central Virginia more of a an even foothold, so to speak, on competitive dollars for smart scale right. um, for road improvement projects. Um you know, when you look at Chesterfield, comparatively speaking, and a lot of people don't know this, but we are the second largest road network in mm. the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, second only to Fairfax County, mm. with over 4,000 miles of roads in Chesterfield County. Mm-hmm. And those roads are maintained by VDOT. Right. So when, when it snows, VDOT's providing the, the, the clearing for the snow. And when you look at road projects such as fixing bridges or mm. repaving roads, um, that more or less falls on VDOT. And right. even some of it could be curb and sidewalk, depending on if it's in the VDOT right away and if right, it's something right. they actually put in. Um, the county actually, um, uh, when we look at new road development or in cer- certain cases, we may have to use funds for improvements. For mm-hmm. example, you'll see different roundabouts that have come in on Otterdale and Genito Road, as an example, which is a, a good improvement for um, traffic movement out there. Um, the current project that we're getting ready to fund now, which would be the, the fix the flooding on Otterdale Road, mm-hmm. that has occurred um, by raising up three sections of the road. It's, a, it's about a total $26 million project that, um, you know, it, because it was a public safety issue, the fact that people got, you know, mm-hmm. 
basically stranded in their Stranded homes right. during the flood. Right. So the county had to take an action on that. I'm very happy that uh, the rest of the board realized that and we were able to put funds forward. Um, you know, we're going to still continue to fight for dollars uh, at the state level in the, in the transportation shed that can be utilized for, you know, fixing some of the crumbling roads that we have. If you right. go in, out into the district and look at some of the 30-year-old subdivisions that we have, it looks like a, uh, an alligator's back in places where the mm-hmm. roads actually crumbled. Yep. And so... Um, you know, we have needs like that all across uh, Chesterfield County um, that uh, need to be addressed. And and certainly we've tried to, um, to work with VDOT through CDOT mm-hmm. to prioritize where we need uh, these improvements. Mm-hmm. Um, but then in the long-term transportation plan, which is why we do long-term studies, um, you know, we look at um, growth uh, trends. And so, for example, Western Matoka out on Hull Street, fastest growing um part of the county in the last 10 years, over 14,500 mm-hmm. people moved there. And um, we have some infrastructure needs that we need to catch up on. Mm-hmm. And if we don't, then it's the traffic out there already is very congested in Western Hull Street. And people who live out there will tell you that they try to avoid it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we, there's some widening we we're going to need to do and some intersection improvements we're going to need to do uh, as you move further west on Hull Street. Right. Certainly, there was a there was a plan in place years ago to widen Hull Street from, to three lanes on each side from Wood Lake all the way to Otterdale Road. Right, that was that kind of fell by the wayside. Now we've got it back as a priority, mm-hmm. something we have to do. Um, but truth, when you go back to ninety one, there was uh, the Upper Magnolia um, mm-hmm. project. Um, part of that project said that you need to build the Poway Parkway extension, mm-hmm. and if you don't, and you build this out, which was supposed to be at the time forty eight hundred units. Um, then you're going to have an infrastructure problem, right. a transportation problem. And right. so, but since then, so that's coming out of the ground. It's an absolutely beautiful subdivision. So mm-hmm. is Harper's Mill. I'm not, I, don't, I'm, I don't get commission for this. I'm just <laughs> I'm talking about the fact that they've been the number one and number two fastest selling communities in the entire Richmond area for the last mm-hmm. couple of years. That's why you've seen that type of growth. Well, then all of the other neighborhoods that have come out of the ground out there as well, Westerly Summer Lake, mm-hmm. um, Ashbrook Landing, um, Hampton Park, we used to hunt there, right? Now right. it's everybody lives there. But when you look at all those other houses that have come out of the ground um, and, and townhomes that have come out of the ground, Fox Creek, Foxfire, all of the developments, um, they weren't even taken into consideration when the plan was to put the right. Poe White Parkway in place. Right. And so they weren't even taken into consideration right. at that point. And now they're there. Now, right. And there are, there's, uh, not, I don't have the specific number in front of me, but I know it's over probably 6,000 units. Mm-hmm. It's actually closer to seven that have already been approved that can come out of the ground in the next 10 years. Right. So when you look at that and you go, okay, so what is the transportation need if that right. happens? Right. So we have to look at that. And so there's been a, a comprehensive transportation study done that's just released that uh, I'm still reviewing myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so we have to look at that so that um, – we can improve those roads uh, in timing of lights. There's a bunch of different factors that can be taken into consideration so that the quality of life for people who live out there still remains and that it doesn't become too congested where people go, traffic is crazy, I don't wanna live out there. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm afraid that if we don't fix the roads, if we don't bring those improvements out right. there, essentially that's what's gonna happen. And, right. and it's gonna come to a point, You know, we also need to look at Hull Street from from 288 West to mm-hmm. Woodlake uh, is 3.3 miles, and to Otterdale is 4.3 miles. We have over 60,000 people living in this area out there that are using the same 4.3 miles right. to shop. Right. They go to the wall, the, the different stores out there, the right. different grocery stores, using that same stretch of road. Right. Um, whereas if you look at Melothian and you take you start at Chippenham in 360, well, then you have Stonebridge and you have a bunch of shops there. And then you have a, a smattering of different businesses all the way west as you go out to Courthouse in, three, courthouse in 60. Mm-hmm. Then you have a town center, uh, Chesterfield Town Center there. And then you have other stores that people can shop like Kohl's, Target. Right. And then when you go further west out to Westchester, you again have grocery stores. You have a Wegmans on your way out there. You have a Kroger out there, you have a Target, and you have a, a bunch of different restaurants that are out there. And so for the population that lives along Melothian, you have a much bigger array mm-hmm. of places to go right. in order to shop and, to, and you know what, whatever you may need. And right. some of those retails up there are specialties, like Northern Tool, for example. Right. So 
for Hull Street, in order to try and alleviate some of that traffic, you've actually got to think about in the future about pushing some of that commercial growth further west. Right. That will cut down on trips going east. Right. So for someone who gets up in the morning and says, I want to go to Dunkin' Donuts, well, there's only one Dunkin' Donuts out in front of Deer Run on Hull right. Street. So if right. you live in Mag Green and that's your goal to get Dunkin' Donuts, right. then you have to go through all that traffic to get right. there. But if they put a Dunkin' Donuts out in front of Mag Green, well, then yeah, cuts down on trips. And right. so the long-term plan of what you look at is not just transportation, but you know, controlling the growth as it proceeds west mm-hmm. to make sure that what you're putting in actually meets the needs of what the community is looking for. Right. Um, and then some of that has to, you know, so the big question right now in Western Hull Street is, well, how do we build the Poway Parkway? It's, it was slated to be built by private development for 30 years. It did not happen. Right. The county now owns it, and now we have to figure out a way to try and build the road. Well, there's, there's a couple of schools of thought on that. And one is that you can do a public-private partnership, and certainly that's something that we've been looking into. The problem with that is cost. Right. Um, if you've ever driven on 895 yeah. to go to the airport, you know it's $4.50 each yeah. way yeah. because that is a private, public-private partnership that's right. managed by VDOT. It's owned by somebody else, and they actually have control and can set rates on tolls based on usage. Right. Right now, the 75-cent toll that we have on 76 um, is set to expire in 2027. That toll's been on that road since its inception, since right. I started as a recruit here. But if... To try and build the Poet Parkway to do that, more than likely that, that stretch of road is going to have to retain a toll. Exactly. Right? right. And those tolls are not short term. They're 75 years plus on a toll like that. And don't take my word for it. Anybody who's watching, take a look at public-private partnerships for these type of roads all across the Commonwealth of Virginia. Up in northern Virginia, it's 3 and $4 each way right. on some of the roads. And then... There are some options where, because of technology, you can change that rate based on peak times and off-peak times. You know, if it's midnight, it's twenty-five cents. Where it's peak time, it's three. Which is incredibly frustrating if you're not used to it, right? And, you know, or even if you are someone who lives around an area like that, right. And you have to pay that toll. That's yeah. That's well, this is you're talking about adding a cost, um, not just on what it costs someone in fuel to go to work back and forth if they're going to Richmond, but you're talking about an actual cost each way mm-hmm. um, that comes out of their pocket. No yep. one's they're not getting reimbursed for that. And so um, when you look at how to do that, again, that's one way. Another way is to try and attract federal dollars and state dollars through economic development that can help pay for the road, uh, if not pay for the entire road. Um, But how you score for those dollars, how you actually qualify for those dollars is tied on what the actual purpose of the road is. Right. So if our road, which is the Boyd Parkway Extension, is to actually service mostly residential, and we're competing against the widening of 64 to Hampton Roads, which right. services a much bigger picture for transportation in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, we may not score as well and compete for those dollars, those statewide dollars. And even in some of the projects in Northern Virginia, we may not compete. Mm-hmm. But if we're doing some economic development, um, even in, in the western part of Hull Street, even if it's not just that parcel of land that we're talking about for Upper Mag, but even mm-hmm. somewhere else, right. well, the justification for that road – um, for state dollars and federal dollars, uh, it ramps up. And so, you know, I would rather find a way to, to find a, a way to do this without having to put a hefty toll on the community for the next 75 years. Absolutely. And you mentioned, you know, it seems like there's just this balance, right? There's the infrastructure piece, there's the, the needs of the community piece, right? Which is not just amenities for those, you know, regardless of age, but what they need out of their, their infrastructure, but then also to sort of the, the, the long-term planning that goes into that. And, I, I, you mentioned Upper Magnolia. I want to talk about that for just a second because I know that's obviously a, a, a something that's coming down the pike, and um, um, there's a lot of you know community uh, meetings, and mm-hmm. you know I know the planning commission is working through it. I think they scheduled another um, a work session on it as we speak here today. But I'm just curious from your point of view. Obviously, you know you're talking um, what 2,500 acres of land. There aren't that many. 22, 1,700, 2,200, yeah. depends. So so somewhere in that ballpark, and there aren't that many tracts of land like that sort of out there for Chesterfield. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious from a land use standpoint, and certainly when you look at the, the property as a whole, you've got the east and the west, and, and at least as it's currently, you know, mm-hmm. um, constructed or, or planned, you know, on the one side you've got some residential and, and some infrastructure, and on the, on the west side you've got essentially like a mix of business possibilities and things. And I'm just curious from your point standpoint, as you work through this rezoning, you talk to members of the community, um, what are the questions that you get and, and sort of how, um, how are you sort of approaching 
this specific uh, this specific case. Well, we would need a lot more time <laughs> uh, to, to address all of the questions that we're getting hit. Right. They're, they're all great questions from the community. Right. You know, as an example, one of the things that the transportation study on the eastern side has shown that, you know, originally we wanted to do um, – a school campus that could have a middle school, a high school, and an elementary school, and even a public library on a couple hundred acres. Um, sounds on paper like it's a great idea. Um, it's a great location for a middle school and an elementary school by far. But the problem that gets generated with a 2,200 student high school is trips per day, trips per day right. generation really puts the trips in that area too high. Right. We can't create a situation where the traffic, the roads in the, in the future cannot handle the trip generation, mm-hmm. um, even though we think it's a great concept. So, but I, my, you know, my realization is we're going to have to move the high school somewhere else. Um, because, you know, if not, then the cost of widening out of their road to four lanes and Duval Road to four lanes and all the other infrastructure improvements that would be required, um, uh, it, the county's not going to be able to absorb that in the short term. Right. Uh, and quite frankly, the neighbors who live in Wesley Parkway, they're happy with their two-lane road coming in and out, and they don't want to have it widen to four lanes. Um, even though that road was designed for that in, in, the, in, in the design phase and the right-of-way phase, I get it from the character of their neighborhood. And that does concern me that, uh, you know, we can't have, uh, um, you know, it would be better if that neighborhood was truthfully not there and it was raw land and, and we could put a road through it. And we certainly can put a road coming from the southern end from Duval Mm-hmm. Uh, from a connectivity wise to come up a four lane road there that actually truthfully can tie in with Westerly Parkway. And I'd like to see that road continue all the way up to Genito Road to, to Horner Park. That adds for connectivity in the whole area. It adds for connectivity for the people who live in Westerly and Summer Lake to have an avenue to get right up to Genito to go to Horner Park uh, and have a trailway system that goes with it. But uh, to try and say that we're going to try and bring people from the whole area once you design what that school system looks like and what that geographical area that it services, mm-hmm. um, I think it's going to overload the roadways too much to have the high school there. So we do that. We we, we reduce those trip generation numbers. Uh, we, we don't have to widen Westerly Park with the four lanes. Um, I do think, you know, some of the other concerns are, and, and we'll talk about Westerly, you know, they have a playground right alongside the road. Um, you know, further back as you go in, um, I've asked staff to look at the feasibility of putting a tunnel under the road mm-hmm. so that people have access and not have to cross over the road to get there. Um, we may actually, quite frankly, and again, this is just things that I'm thinking about is, um, you know, we have some land back there that the county actually owns for this. We may have to look at seeing what the feasibility is, to even move their playground to an area that is closer to where those cross paths are mm-hmm. and even something on each side of it for each side of the community. So. Um, certainly, I know that uh, there are the, the people in the neighborhood don't want um, a four-lane road going through there, and I think that we can accomplish, truthfully, from looking at where the majority of the students would be coming from, Mag Green, Harper's Mill, um, you know, those two big neighborhoods, the Foxes off of Woolworth mm-hmm. Road, most of those that traffic will come up out of Dale and probably cross over and onto Duval and then make a right into the new road and go up into the schools. Mm-hmm. So I think we can, you know, program that out, and by have an additional access going across up to Genito, be able to manage how the, the uh, traffic flow works right. and, and not hurt that community mm-hmm. in the sense of what they love as far as, far as living there. Right. Be able to provide something really special that their kids can walk to school, to elementary school, walk mm-hmm. to school for junior high school, and perhaps even have a library out there in the future. Right. And on the west side, you get, what, 1,700-ish acres, mm-hmm. uh, primarily, um, you know, zone residential that wants to uh, to basically, go, you know, some sort of office park, some sort of place where you can bring in some business um, idea being, I guess, to uh, tax revenue for residential is very different than tax revenue for, you know, commercial. And I'm just curious, what do you see on the west side of that project? So right now, it's the, the county ha- in, in what uh, the board has put forward in the action is limiting to about eight general uses of I-2. I think that needs to, we need to narrow the focus down on that more, mm-hmm. uh, quite frankly. I think we also need to add some uses. Uh, I think there's room for some commercial uses in there. Um, I also think there's some use for a hospital in the mm-hmm. western part of Hull Street. Um, so I think there's some other uses that through community input that can be put into that, that could kind of shrink the footprint for the I-2 uh, into a smaller footprint um, and then actually have on the perimeter out there, uh, I, I know, for example, that the buffers that were proffered are way too small. We need larger buffers along uh, 
the west the the mm-hmm. western part of this where it meets people's property and mm-hmm. certainly along the poet park when it comes through but truth of the matter is none of that can be done as far as the western side if you don't build a road right we cannot have um we can't come up with a solution that's worse than the problem yeah okay so if you build if you don't build a road and you bring say 2000 jobs out there that work for one company and you build the road from Hull Street up to where that is, everybody's still using the same type of infrastructure to get out there, which right. means you've added to the problem. You've not s- solved the problem. When we connect Woolridge Road to 288, and that's coming in the future, you will see truck traffic divert from Hull Street through Woolridge Road and cut over to get to 288 North because that way they can avoid the 4.3 mile of congestion. Right. That between, everybody's using that right? everybody's using right now, and so you will see a large increase of traffic on Woolridge Road. And I, I'm not in favor of that. I think that those are all residential neighborhoods that go through there. We have schools there, and I think that is going to be a problem in the future. The Poet Parkway was designed to actually carry that load. Um, that's why it was required in the original zoning case. And we've certainly improved Woolridge. It's a great road. People are speeding on it, so we have to deal with that. Um, but. Um, we need to we need to work on that long term plan mm-hmm. that will in the future alleviate the traffic problem. If we don't, we could simply say, "Look, let's just build the schools, let's fix out of their road, and we'll worry about this other stuff later." Mm-hmm. That actually sounds familiar because I think that's actually what's happened. Mm-hmm. And so we've approved all of these other uh, fantastic look. Western Hulsey is a great place to live. There are fantastic neighborhoods. There's a great choice of what you can, where you can live, what product you want. Um, and there are some that you can, like Hancock Village, which is right behind the Walmart. You literally can walk right to the store. You can go to the restaurants over there. Um, you know, Woodlake, just to name a few. But if we don't fix the infrastructure at, point, at some point, people are going to not be happy living out there. Absolutely. Well, Mr. Carroll, I very much appreciate your time. Obviously, there's a, a lot to do, especially in that one specific case, but a lot going on for the county. So I appreciate you giving us a few minutes here on the podcast. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure to be here. All right. You can uh, follow us on social media. On uh, Twitter, it's at Chesterfield VA. And on Instagram, it's Chesterfield Virginia, all one word. And on Facebook, you can check, check us out our Chesterfield Behind the Mic. Make sure to like that page so you can keep up with us as we go forward. Now, let me give you all the ways that you can watch the show. You can watch us on our YouTube channel as well on our website, chesterfield.gov slash podcast. An audio-only version of the show is also available there, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, and a whole host of other options. You can also watch the show on WCCT. That's Thursday through Sunday at 7. And on the weekends at noon, that's Comcast Channel 98 and Verizon Channel 28. Lastly, you can check out chesterfield.gov slash connect with us for more ways that you can get in touch with us and find out more information. And I want to say thank you to my director, Martin Stiff, my producer, Susan Pollard, and all the good folks here at Communications Media for all they do to make this thing work. So... For all of us here in Chesterfield, thanks very much for making us part of your day. We'll see you again soon. Take good care.